Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Eugenie C. Scott, who is the founding executive director of the National Center for Science Education. She is a past president of the American Association of Physical Anthropologists. Among her most notable recent honors, the Public Service Medal of the National Academy of Sciences, the Fellows Medal of the California Academy of Sciences, and the first Stephen J. Gould Prize Society for the Study of Evolution. Scott is the author of Evolution versus Creationism and co-editor with Glenn Branch of Not in Our Classrooms, Why Intelligent Design is Wrong for Our Schools. Eugenie, welcome to Berkeley. Thank you. Where were you born and raised? La Crosse, Wisconsin. And I was born there, but we kind of bounced between La Crosse, Minneapolis, and Milwaukee. And looking back, how do you, did your parents shape your thinking about the world? Hardly at all, <laughs> because my father left my uh, mother when I was about four years old or so. I really don't have any memory of him, him living with us. He was somebody who visited on odd occasions. Um, my mother had four kids, and she was kind of running pretty hard most of the time, just kind of keeping up with us and the world. Um, I think I got interested in science uh, despite my family mm -hmm. <laughs> upbringing more than anything else. And, and what about religion? Was religion a part of your life? My mother was Christian science. And uh, we, uh, initially, we went to the Christian science church. Uh, I remember I remember the Sunday school being terribly, terribly boring because they'd give us a Bible. This is the worst Sunday school approach ever. And the, the kids who could read would go through the, the columns on the page counting the number of times that the word love occurred. No wonder people leave churches. I mean, that was just terrible. Uh, when I was probably, I don't know, maybe seven, eight, nine years old or so, uh, my older sister decided that um, Christian science wasn't really where it was at. So she took us to the um, congregational church in our neighborhood. And I uh, enjoyed attending the congregational church very much. Now it's called the United Church of Christ, but that's the historical name for it. I sang in the choir, um, remained um, uh, in the church uh, through high school. And was it school then that drew you into science? And, and when, did that, that, uh, uh, when did that science spark for you? You know, I think I just was always interested in nature. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the way a lot of people get into science. They are interested in animals and or bugs or stars or dirt or something like that. And I remember uh, as a sort of fourth grade kid in, in Minneapolis, living there at the time, there was a vacant lot at the end of our block. And now it's got a you know, apartment building on it. But at the time, it was a vacant lot. And I would go there, and I would lie in the dirt and the grass, and I would mm. look look for creatures and just smell the sounds and listen to the birds. And, and I was just very, very happy to just be immersed in that kind of tiny, I called it my miniature Serengeti. This was my tiny little, little refuge from the, the busy city and the streets and the cars and the noise. And w when were you drawn to anthropology? Was it uh, uh, as an undergraduate or a graduate student? Before that, actually. Um, my, uh, I suppose I shouldn't really tell this story about my older sister, but um, my older sister, one of my older sisters, uh, was attending the University of Minnesota. And she brought home her textbooks, and she was taking a course in anthropology. And yeah, I, then as now, I was pretty much of a of a compulsive reader. I must have been probably in sixth grade, sixth or seventh grade, sixth grade maybe. Um, and I started looking through this book called Anthropology. I didn't know what anthropology was, and I came to the human evolution section, and there were these. And I, I know what they are now, of course, uh, as a professional. But they were the the old Smithsonian Institution reconstructions from like. The turn of the century, mm. of um, of Cro-Magnon and and Neanderthal and Homo erectus, and, and I looked at these, and, whoa! <laughs> these were just 
this was just the, mo who are, what's, what is this, what's this? And, and, um, and she said, um, well, you know, that's called anthropology. Okay, I want to be an anthropologist because th these, these, are, these are our ancestors. Uh, and I actually said at the time, this kind of looks like your boyfriend, and she didn't like that at all. But uh, uh, nonetheless, uh, I, I, I got inspired by looking at a, uh, a college textbook when I was in about sixth grade. Then in seventh grade, my um, uh, junior high teacher, middle school teacher, uh, assigned us a, by that time we had moved to Milwaukee, uh, he assigned us a uh, term paper, as it were, that we had to write a biography of a famous scientist, which is a really boring topic, but nonetheless, that's what they did back then. And so I decided to do a, um, a, uh, a term paper on Eugene Dubois, who was the discoverer of Homo erectus, which my teacher had never heard of Eugene Dubois at all. He didn't know what Homo erectus was, and I think I got an A on the paper because he had no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> but I had to go to the public library and find these, you know, references on human evolution, which were way above my reading level because they were, you know, all college level stuff. But I, I, I would love to have had that paper now <laughs> to see what I had extracted from those. Materials. So, so it was natural for you to major in. Uh, uh, anthropology Absolutely. and then do your dissertation on that. Absolutely. And where did you do your dissertation and who was your mentor? I did my dissertation, I did my master's at UW-Milwaukee, my bachelor's and my master's there. And then uh, came out, moved out to California with my uh, first husband and uh, he was an anthropology professor actually and uh, worked out here for a while with a master's degree. That was you know, that was in the um, in the, the late 60s when you could do that. You could teach at the college level with, the, you know, the soldiers were coming back from the war and there was a real need for college professors. So I was able to teach at the university level with a master's degree, and I loved it. I really, really liked explaining evolution and anthropology to, uh, to students who were only a couple years younger than I was, but nonetheless. And so I decided I really have to get a graduate degree. I really have to get a PhD. So one of my professors from uh, UWM had uh, subsequently in the, in the a few years there, had moved to the University of Missouri. And I thought, well, you know, I still have more to learn from him and he treated me fairly. Um, so I went and got my PhD at the University of Missouri. And what was your dissertation on? Bones and teeth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had uh, gone to, to Peru to work with a series of uh, archaeologically excavated uh, skeletal materials, uh, which was a, f a really great series of um, South American, uh, Native American remains because they were all radiometrically dated. We knew what time period these you know, bodies had come from. And we could, we also knew from the archeological information what uh, their, their subsistence, food supply, et cetera, had been. So I had a string of, of skeletons that went from very early hunting and gatherers through various intermediate uh, forms of food production to full corn, bean, squash, Inca food production. And what happens to their teeth and their craniofacial structure when you make those kinds of changes in diet? So it was a very, it was an interesting topic, although the sample was really small, and so I don't think anybody is actually looking up that dissertation for great enlightenment. But I basically found things that people have found subsequently. How, how do you account for your movement from physical anthropology to advocacy and activism, uh, interestingly enough, focused in, in the first instance on evolution? Well, you know, <clears throat> it's an interesting thing. Um, in, at the time, when I started teaching after I got my PhD, that was in 1974 at the University of Kentucky. And uh, at the time, um, it's changed fortunately since then, but at the time, if you wanted to study evolution, the place that you were guaranteed to get evolution was in the anthropology department. I would teach a service course, as we called them, um, and it was, it was a great service course because if you were a uh, social studies or humanities major, you could take my biological anthro class for social science credit. If you were a science major, you could take it for science credit or vice versa if you needed to <laughs> fulfill some university requirement. So I had all kinds of people in my introductory physical anthropology class. 
And I would have these uh, these biology majors who were seniors who just needed to kind of tidy up their uh, class requirements so that they could graduate. So, oh well, this sounds kind of like science. Let's take that and we'll you know we'll check off the box for social studies. And of course, they found that it was a whole lot more science than they thought it was. But there you go. And at the end of this semester, I would have, you know, because basically we got evolution from day one. You know? And at the end of the semester, I would have students come up to me and say, "So that's it." <laughs> because over in the biology department in 19, the you know, mid-1970s, they really weren't being explicit about common ancestry explains everything in biology, right? Uh, we would talk about taxonomy, you know, the, the Linnaean system of kingdom, phylum, class, order, genus, genus and species. And, you know, and I, I just once mentioned to my students, I said, oh, and the reason why we can, we can um, group animals in this hierarchical fashion, you know, we can group species into genera, genera into families, et cetera, is because evolution generates hierarchy. And that was, you know, the, so that's it. There was this sort of, ah. So I was kind of nostril deep in evolution from day one as an academic. Then when I was living in Lexington, the Lexington Board of Education was approached by the Citizens for Balanced Teaching of Origins in 1980, which was a community group that wanted the Lexington Board of Education to include this new science of creation science to teach along with evolution. And we'd be on the cutting edge of science education. And uh, I had gotten interested in the creationist movement really as a graduate student because Jim Gavin, who is, uh, you asked my mentors, Jim Gavin was probably my main mentor as uh, shaping my view of anthropology. Wonderful man, now deceased. But Jim gave me some uh, creationist literature when I was a, you know, like a first year graduate student. And man, I started collecting this stuff because it was so interesting. So when this big controversy happened in Lexington, I was the person on campus. I was the person on the science faculty who actually knew what creation science was. And I had a whole box of literature for it. Hmm. So I got interested in the creation and evolution controversy pretty early. <laughs> what, did, what skill, the skills and temperament of a physical anthropologist and the skills and temperament uh, of, a, of an activist, somebody who's an advocate, are somewhat different. Did, did the second build on the first? You know, in other words, or was there not that much contradiction between the two? You know, I, I, I don't... I don't know that, that I can go along with your premise because I don't know uh, that biological anthropologists differ from any other academic or even, frankly, that academics differ that much from accountants or dentists or anybody else. Um, I think that, uh, for example, in the Lexington uh, controversy, which really took almost two years to resolve. And uh, to cut to the chase, the good guys won. The Lexington district decided not to require the teachers to teach creation science. But, you know, I worked with clergy. I worked with um, civil liberties supporters who were, you know, businessmen and, and just normal people. And, of course, there were a lot of us up on campus. But they were from not just the science disciplines, but also history and poli-sci and uh, philosophy of science. So there were a lot of us. And those of us who do get interested in this kind of activist approach, and it is activism, uh, we're trying to you know, influence what goes on in our communities, that's activism. Those of us who were interested, um, I think we're different from other people in the community because A, we cared, <laughs> but we cared for different reasons. You know, we cared for different reasons. The clergy that I worked with, were upset at the thought that somebody would be teaching biblical literalism Monday through Friday and they'd have to straighten the kids out on the weekend, you know, on Saturday or Sunday in, in their churches because we don't believe that in our, in our denomination. And so the Catholics and the mainstream Protestants were on my side. The, um, the business community didn't like the idea of the schools teaching creationism because it, uh, you know, <laughs> kids would be raised with an inferior education. That's just, you don't deliberately teach things that are not true. The teachers didn't like it because they felt that they would be violating some of their professional uh, standards by teaching nonsense when their job is to teach good stuff. So everybody had different reasons for opposing the teaching of creationism. But all of us, I think, had to be willing to step up to the plate. And 
the, the most effective of us had to have communication skills that uh, enabled us to do a good job, to, to persuade the decision makers that our point of view is the one that they should take. And to some degree, being a college professor helps you on that. Because frankly, we're all salesmen. You, know? uh, you sold political science <laughs> when you taught. I sold anthropology. In the best sense of the term, you know, in, in the, that, that you are that you are providing a set of ideas to somebody that you want them to accept. The the difference is that in in your work, and you were the founding director, and I want to talk about your your organization, uh, is that there's greater diversity in in, in as you mobilize people. Yeah. Uh, you, you, there must be a lot of listening. Oh, is that what's bothering you? Then let me address that among different groups and kind of learning that, hey, the business community may be on our side for reasons having to do with whatever, the skills they need. Uh, for, so talk a little about that, because that, that's different than what an academic is doing. Yeah, it is um, in some respects. But in a way, well... I'm trained as an anthropologist. I'm a biological anthropologist, which really is a subfield of biology, and, and certainly the vast majority of the research activity that is done is indistinguishable from what would go on in a biology class. Except that as an anthropologist, we, we look at uh, humans and primates uh, with an additional edge, as it were, and that is in the cultural and historical context. Um, uh, when you study anthropology, you study not just physical anthropology, you study uh, cultural anthropology and archaeology as well. It's a very holistic kind of view of, of what makes humans tick. And as such, one of the things that you learn is that if you're really going to understand a point of view, you have to embed yourself, so to speak. I mean, you have to spend the time and you have to do a lot of listening. It's, it's kind of an ethnographic approach, really. Um, and I think my being an anthropologist did contribute a lot to mm. the orientation that I took. Uh, anthropologists also tend to look in terms of systems. And so I, I didn't know anything about uh, the public education system in the city of Lexington. I didn't have a kid in the school. I didn't pay any attention at all to it. But I learned that there's a difference between the superintendent and the board of education and who reports to whom and uh, what does a department chairman do and what's his relationship to the superintendent and who is actually the decision maker in all of this and what's the responsibility of teachers. I learned that K-12 teachers don't have academic freedom that we have at the university level. It's a very, very different thing. And actually, there's very good reasons for that. Um, so one of the things I had to do uh, when I just sort of stepped into this mess in the, the Lexington, what we'd call a flare-up at, at NCSE, when, when I had to, you know, when, when I was the leader, or one of the leaders in coping with this flare-up, is I had to figure out, you know, the, the political system <laughs> but also what is the, uh, what's going on in the religious community. And I, I, I had to spend time with them. Uh, I had some very good informants and Rabbi Leffler and the uh, Unitarian <laughs> minister then. Um, you know, what are, what are the forces within the religious community that could help to support my point of view versus those who oppose? But also, and here's where the real anthropology comes in, you know, why do they feel the way they do? Why is there this strong opposition to evolution? What are the re people don't just do things for no good reason. What are the reasons that people are so concerned about their kids learning evolution in the public schools? And if you really understand that, can you have can you start a conversation to try to figure out how you can assuage those concerns because they're very real and they're very sincere. What, in establishing your organization, the the, uh, the, cent, the National Center for uh, Science Education, what was the biggest challenge and what, what surprised you the most mm -hmm. as you were doing that? Mm -hmm. Well, the biggest challenge for any nonprofit. I mean, I, you know, as we've been talking about, I was a college professor and then I became a nonprofit manager. Uh, I didn't know anything about running a small business, and that's what a nonprofit is it's a business. Um, a nonprofit cannot be no profit because if you make no profit, you go out of business. That's 
the nature of, of a business. Uh, it's just that any profits you make have to be plowed back into your mission and so forth. But but you have to be in the black. Otherwise, you you don't you don't you fire your staff and you you take your books home. Um, so uh, learning how to run a business was actually not that hard. I mean. The business community might wince at that point, but um, I mean, I had a PhD in science. I can learn how to run a business. You know, there, there are. It's, it's not rocket science. Um, but fundraising, persuading people to give money to support the kinds of things that NCSC does, which is basically a lot of what I learned in Lexington. You know, we these problems of the teaching of evolution are local and state problems. It's you know that's where that's where education takes place. We're very decentralized. So what we did at NCSE and do and continue under my successor, what NCSE does is support people in communities who want to see that their kids get good good at science education. So we help them form coalitions with like-minded people to find out all of the interest groups in their community that might care about this issue and how can you all work together. Uh, we teach them how to write uh, letters to the editor if we need to. We teach them how to make a, a, a good presentation to a school board or to a board of education at the state level or a state legislature because there are definitely skills involved in that. Um, we give them the background in science, which they often do not know. We give them the background in theology many times, which is also a very important part of this. We give them the legal background, because this is ultimately a matter of church and state separation, and foundationally. Uh, we talk about the pedagogical issues, and there's even philosophical, philosophy of science issues as well. So there's a lot of different areas that nobody knows everything about, but NCSE can help local groups to uh, have the information that they need to make this, the uh, argument that good science should be taught, evolution should be taught, nature of science should be taught. Religiously based groups can be talked about outside of science classes, but they should not be presented as true science in a science class. What about the community of scientists? You were uh, a scientist. Mm -hmm. uh, you oh, were Dan. you were <laughs> you were uh, sounding the alarm bell in the night in a way. Was was there difficulty there in sci getting scientists out of the, the 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 their labs and and into the public space? Well, um, we're talking. I, I became director of NCSE in the late eighties, nineteen eighty six. By the 1980s, I think there had been enough creationism and, of course, intelligent design was just, just starting to ramp up in the late 80s that I think the science community was having this wait a minute moment. And, uh, and of course, most of my staff were from the science. I'm a scientist. Most of my staff were from science. And I think all of us had uh, connections with different scientific disciplines. And we found scientists very responsive. Now, not 100%, but that's going to be the case any time. But we, um, one, of the, one of the sources that we tapped was the Associations of Science, uh, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, uh, the National Academy of Sciences, which is not really an association, but uh, the um, uh, Geological, uh, GSA, Geological Society of America. Uh, of course, the physical anthropologists, they were strongly behind us. Um, the various American Institute for Biological Sciences. There were a lot of scientist organizations that um, that NCSE dealt with, and I would be asked to speak at their meetings, and I would uh, speak with their officers and help explain, you know, why this is a problem and why we needed scientists to help and what scientists could do to help. And we had we established networks of scientists. So scientists and teachers were actually our core constituencies. And in fact, back in the late 70s and early 80s, early 80s certainly, when NCSE was just getting started, it was scientists and teachers who really put this organization together. Uh, help us understand the way scientists think and, and, uh, and the way uh, creationists, let's just create that broad category. We, uh, uh, what's the difference in the way they think and then the hurdle in, in getting them to talk to each other or at least understand each other, if not talk to each other? 
I think the first thing is to make a distinction. Um, you said scientists and creationists, and that tends to be two separate sets. Mm -hmm. um, although some creationists are trained in science, they're pretty much outside of the scientific mainstream. That's very different from saying that there are two sets, scientists and religious people. Mm -hmm. That's not the same thing, because many religious people are scientists, many scientists are religious people, uh, many theologians are really interested in science, and that's part of their theology. Um, so it's not a distinction bet between science and religion so much as it is a distinction between scientifically oriented people and everybody else. And I think this is really what you're getting to, but I wanted to be sure to make that distinction because I'm not talking about all religious people when I'm talking about creationists. The difference between creationists and, you know, real scientists, if you will, is that creationists start with a conclusion. They have the revealed truth of the Bible and they believe that this um, trumps all um, uh, empirical evidence. If there's a difference between what their interpretation of the Bible says and what you see in nature, well, you just must not be interpreting nature correctly. And the way they interpret the Bible, the traditional young earth creationists, the Bible is interpreted as requiring a young earth of only thousands of years old, 6,000, the more radical will go all the way up to 10,000, but certainly not billions, not, not anywhere near that. The Bible requires in their interpretation the special creation of the whole universe. So galaxies and stars and earth are all specially created. God just went, let there be. And animals and plants and human beings are specially created according to special kinds. Now, you can have evolution within the kind, but, you know, so you can have a dog kind and you can have the evolution of wolves and, and foxes and, and domestic dogs, but that's, that's still the kind. The kind is different. It was a created kind and you don't get, like, dogs and bears having a common ancestor. That's just not allowed whatsoever. So they start with a conclusion. This is the way the world is. And then they basically look through the scientific information to try to find the stuff that supports it. Now, any scientist who's got an explanation, is going to look for corroborating information. We're all going to look for the stuff that supports our point of view. But if you're a real scientist, you go an extra step and you say, if I'm wrong, what should I find? And then you have to look for that. And this is the big difference between creationists and real scientists. They are ignoring any of the information that refutes their point of view. The, 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 the non-scientists. Non-scientists, yes. yes. The creationists have the truth, they cherry pick the data that supports them and ignore or somehow explain away any data that, uh, that, would, be, that would refute their point of view of, you know, of special creation, a young earth, etc. Uh, scientists are constantly, as you point out in your book, rethinking mm -hmm. their theories mm -hmm. based on the <clears throat> empirical evidence. Mm -hmm. and in a way, the, the very rigor and protocol of science mm -hmm. makes uh, their conclusions uh, potentially vulnerable mm -hmm. in the public sphere. Uh, and, and I gather from your uh, discussion of the history of the creationists is that as they move toward trying to come up with a scientific explanation of creation, that they build on a platform that attacks the fact that scientists are changing their mind. Talk a little about that. But the scientists are changing their mind based on empirical evidence, which is uh, they're revising their thinking. Yeah. I mean, what, it's, science, science is an open-ended way of knowing. It's an epistemology that allows you to change your mind. It's a feature, not a bug. Okay. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that everything in science changes, and I think that's, that's an initial idea that I think people may not understand. There are a core idea of science, science core, core set of explanations that have just been tested so much that we're not going to change them. Okay. Um, matter is composed of atoms. The earth goes around the sun. 
Geocentrism is here to stay. Okay. Uh, laws of thermodynamics, living things have common ancestors. There's a lot of core ideas that just aren't going to change. There's a lot of ideas that are frontier ideas, and this is where scientists are working. Some of them are going to work, some of them, and go into the core. Some of them are not going to work, and we abandon them, and that's fine. But not every science is open-ended, but it's reliable, and that's important. That's an important distinction to have. Now, one of the problems that creationists have, which you mentioned, is that they are not flexible in changing their explanations. New evidence is not going to make them alter their point of view. Uh, they will explain it away, they will ignore it, they will in some other way discredit it because they already have the, the true explanation. But this actually gets back to some very um, very, uh, very old traditions within Christianity um, of, of uh, you know, kind of, well, with, without getting into to, to too much detail on that, although it's an interesting topic. The creationists view science as producing truth, but the truth has to accord with what they already believe is true, and it is a weakness when you change your explanation. So they will criticize evolution by saying, well, you know, last year you said that uh, the big Australopithecines and the little Australopithecines were two separate species, and now you're saying the same species. You guys are always changing your mind about evolution. You know, it's all a bunch of whole cloth. So changing your mind is a, is a structural weakness to them, whereas to us, it's a feature, not a bug. It's how we get closer to an accurate explanation of how the world works. Yeah, the media, uh, in a way, uh, is in its effort to be fair, <clears throat> becomes unfair in the sense that uh, I'm now thinking about uh, uh, news items mm -hmm. on nutrition. Mm -hmm. What's good for you to eat? Is coffee good for you or is it bad for you? Is wine good for you? And, and part of this is they're not understanding what you just described about science. There's, there's constant revision. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the structure there would seem to help in the process of delegitimating science, not in reality, not in science at its core, but what its adversaries are saying against it. You know, it's, it's a double-edged sword. We want the media to cover science because that way the public learns more about science. The public is very interested in science and wants to know more about science. And of course, the more public understands about science, the more likely they are to support it. And basically, the, the, the public does support science. They, I'm happy to say they think more money should be spent on scientific research. But simultaneously, uh, so it's, it's really great that, that the press covers new scientific developments. But there's a lot of stuff that's out there on that frontier, you know, outside of that core. There's a lot of stuff that's still pretty iffy. We're still figuring it out. You know, what's the effect of caffeine on heart disease? What's the effect on heart, caffeine on this kind of heart disease versus that kind of heart? We don't really know yet. And so a study will come out saying A, and the press will report it. A study will come out uh, six months later saying B, the press will report it. We want the press to report it. But the public can get confused because it seems like, um, like these scientists you know, are always changing their mind, like the creationists say. I think where the press could help would be to, to make sure that they're communicating the tentativeness of science. You know, study A has just been produced and it has this conclusion. Uh, generally speaking, if you interview the scientists who wrote the paper of, of paper A, of topic A, they will tell you, well, you know, these are preliminary findings. We think they're strong, but more work needs to be done. Uh, that often doesn't get communicated to the public. And uh, there's a structural problem here, frankly, because most of us in our daily lives, we, we do like certainty. We, we, you know, uncertainty is unsettling in some respects. Is the bus going to come on time or not? There's a lot of little and big things that are uncertain in our lives. But science, any scientist has to be very comfortable with saying, I don't know yet. And I would always encourage them to add the yet. Because again, in terms of communicating with the public about science, the public will, will pick up the idea that 
If you don't know yet, that means you might know in the future. If you just say it's a mystery, people will think, oh, it's unsolvable, which is different. So I don't know yet is something that scientists say all the time and we feel comfortable with. Being comfortable with uncertainty is a distinction that you find more among scientists than the general public. So they get much more upset with paper A saying caffeine affects heart disease X in this way and then somebody coming up six months later and saying no, caffeine does not affect heart disease X in that way. Uh, well, who knows? We don't know yet. We just need to help people understand that yet. In, in your book, you have a, a quote from St. Augustine, which I, I thought was uh, 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 very interesting. Uh, 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 this is what Augustine wrote, St. Augustine. If they find a Christian mistaken in a field which they know well, that is the, the people, and hearing him maintaining his foolish opinions about the scriptures, how then are they going to believe those scriptures in matters concerning the resurrection of the dead, the hope of eternal life, and the kingdom of heaven? How indeed, when they think that their pages are full of falsehoods on facts which they themselves have learned from experience and the light of reason? So he's really warning uh, the, the advocates of Christianity that you can't touch people's, uh, what they sort of know from everyday what, experience. What, it, what he's saying there is that don't interpret the Bible literally. Yeah. And this was Augustine. That was a long time ago, right? The idea, biblical literalism is a relatively recent development in Christian theology. Uh, I think that's also a very well-kept secret in this whole controversy, that interpreting the Bible as six 24-hour days is fairly recent. Uh, you know, I mean, it's been, there's a little background radiation all through Christian history, but, you know, most Christian theologians uh, have not, since Augustine, have not been biblically literalist. Biblical literalism came about as a, um, as a, product of the fundamentalist movement, which was an early 20th century movement. This was not a movement that is, you know, back in the 800s or something like that. This is a movement to sort of refine Protestant Christianity that came about in the 19-teens and 1920s. So it's a pretty recent, as Christianity's been around for a long time, it's a pretty recent movement. And it's been very popular in North America, but it's not especially popular in Europe and, um, in some other parts of the world. It's funny, as you're speaking, what my mind, what comes to my mind is the literalists interpreting the Constitution. <laughs> so there is a... You're a political uh, scientist. Yeah, you? yeah. There, there's <laughs> a study. You, in your book, which, which I heartily mm -hmm. recommend, I should uh, show it, Evolution versus uh, Creationism. Uh, second edition. Second edition, <laughs> published by UC Press. Uh, you you look at the Scopes trial. Mm -hmm. You go through that history because history is is this bigger picture yeah. which you're very you're very attuned to. And to to summarize briefly, uh, the, there were three changes that occurred in the environment at the time of Scopes. One was the rise of fundamentalism, which you just discussed. Uh, the second thing was the importance of second secondary education. The numbers were were really. Uh, increasing there. And uh, the third factor uh, is escaping me right now, but there was another historical uh, factor. Oh, uh, well, uh, World War One. Yeah, World I War mean, One, yeah. And the whole, the, um, that's right, and the whole uh, uh, discrediting mm -hmm. of the survival of the fittest mm -hmm. notion. So, so this was a, a, a classic battle, which was won by indirectly by the, the evolutionists. Mm -hmm. But then in, in the aftermath of that, evolution wasn't put in the text. So therefore... In fact, the, it was taken out of the, the text. text. Yeah. There was more evolution before scopes, more evolution in textbooks and in the curriculum before scopes than after. And, and so ironically, the court victory didn't have the positive repercussions. But then evolu uh, evolution and this conflict with the creationists comes back when we have the space race in the 1950s. So, so uh, the, the importance of what you're saying here is the, the broader environment, the social context, the, the, the political history uh, is, is very important for the ups and downs right. of this controversy. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, that summarizes the history very nicely. Um, Anti-evolutionism has been a sine wave. It's waxed and waned over time. 
like I was saying a moment ago, before the Scopes trial at the turn of the century, uh, you can find textbooks that talk about this relatively new idea. It's only 50, 60 years old from Charles Darwin that living things have common ancestors. And here's this explanation of natural selection for how it works. And, you know, this is new science and so forth. And it was ex assumed in the textbooks. Um, when more and more kids started going to school, you know, like the number of kids um, in secondary school, you know, generally speaking at the turn of the century, if you got to eighth grade, you were well educated and that was it. But with high school becoming much more common and urbanization, um, more people were being exposed to these textbooks and with the creationist, excuse me, with the fundamentalist movement and a biblical literalist uh, kind of theology being pushed, there was a conflict. So, you know, evolution was taken out of the textbooks again and stayed out until the uh, 1960s when because of the uh, the scare of the Russians getting to space first, the National Science Foundation started funding science education and including the publication of textbooks written by scientists in biology, geology, physics, um, and earth science. And the biology textbooks, because they were written by practicing university scientists and master teachers, included evolution. So evolution got into the uh, uh, text uh, into the curriculum again, which generated opposition from the mm -hmm. creationists because they didn't have to worry between about 1930 and about 1965. They didn't have to worry about uh, evolution being taught because it wasn't being taught. Mm -hmm. But once it started being taught again, that ramped up the anti-evolution movement. And eventually the equal time laws of the late 70s started being proposed where you had to balance evolution by the teaching of creation science, which they had invented. Um, and so evolution started going out of the textbooks again. We fought to put it back in in the 80s, and that, plus some court decisions, generated uh, the intelligent design movement. So, you know, if it's not one damn thing, it's another. <laughs> uh, you also, in your book, uh, ha have an interesting discussion of essentially myth and of the notion, and myth being the ideas that are central to uh, uh, a society or a nation. And in a way, some of the myths come from the, the way people live, uh, the social experience of their lives. And you point out that the school, the history of the schools being a decentralized mm -hmm. enterprise, you yeah. talked about, as are the churches. Mm -hmm. And so you got local control, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, which means that all the battles are often in a decentralized area, as, as you've discussed in your first awakening to this. And uh, it seems, so this is what I want to pose to you, which is the progressive agenda really often comes from the center at the national level, mm -hmm. you know, whereas then the fight emerges uh, with the, the local level, which in, embraces some of the non-scientific uh, uh, ways of looking at things. Talk a little about that. Is that unfair? Or? Uh, well, the there, it's a push me pull you kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, education is highly decentralized. Decisions about what gets taught, who's going to teach, how much you're going to pay, those are all local decisions. To some degree, in the last 20 years, it's the focus has shifted a little bit more to the state, partly for funding reasons. If the state is going to give money to the local districts, they can tie strings to it, so there may be some curricular uh, 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 pressures on states, uh, on local districts. But really, a local district can decide to thumb its nose at the state and teach any damn thing it wants. Um, well, you know, within constitutional mm -hmm. <laughs> reason, you can't teach the violent overthrow of the government. That's treason, so they're not going to teach that. But the decentralization is really important in American education, and so, as a result, um, when evolution creeps back into the textbooks and. Uh, people on the local level notice this tends to support national anti-evolutionist organizations. Um, 
the Institute for Creation Research and later Answers in Genesis and a whole raft of small uh, anti-evolutionist organizations have sprung up at, at different times, the ICR being the most important in, in terms of my work. Um, and uh, they, they are very influential because they, they're sort of our evil twin. <laughs> Somebody's going to quote me on that, I know it. But they provide information for their grassroots people, just like NCSE provides information for grassroots people on our side of these issue to better persuade decision makers at so the okay, local level. So we can't say level. they're evil. No. They're just the opposite <laughs> side. Yeah, okay. Well, <laughs> we'll just, yeah. 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 It's, it's a joke about yeah, the evil yeah, twin, yeah. but, you know, because that's a okay. cultural motif. But, yeah. But it's like, you know, the black and the white. It's like the, uh, the yin and yang. I mean, yeah. The national organizations uh, provide information to the grassroots, but if it doesn't get done at the grassroots, it doesn't get done. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, people always ask me, oh, with a new administration or now that that administration is gone, it's going to be easier, it's going to be harder. The federal government has hardly anything to do with curriculum. And whether evolution is taught or not is a curricular issue. And curriculum is determined at the state and local level. So regardless of what somebody at a, in a given administration believes about uh, creationism, they're not going to be able to do a heck of a lot to see that when the classroom door gets shut in Mrs. Brown's classroom, she's going to pull out the creation science materials. Um, there also has been a legal history of uh, the battles between evolution and anti-evolution for, uh, well, let's see, now for almost 100 years. Um, that, that is very relevant to this whole controversy as well. But just in terms of the national and decentral, national grassroots decentralization uh, versus uh, local control, um, it's a combination of factors, but the, the NCSE would not have been able to accomplish as much as it's accomplished over the years of our existence if it hadn't been for people at the grassroots willing to take the time and spend the energy and a tremendous amount of effort in trying to see that good science gets taught in their schools. Uh, as we see in the world today, let's talk about today, and we see a, a movement across the globe toward authoritarianism. Uh, in various degrees, some might even speculate about that movement here in the United mm -hmm. States. And, and uh, authoritarian demagogic leaders basically often built their, their, their platform on fear, mm -hmm. anxiety, untruths, shall we call them, if not lies. Uh, do, do you see this as a more precarious environment as things evolve in this direction in terms of the, the battles you're fighting? Well, just as a citizen, I'm very concerned with these kinds of pressures. Uh, I mean, it's, it is something that I think all citizens ought to be concerned about. In terms specifically of the creation and evolution issue, I think it's, it's less closely related. Um, simply because of the of the grassroots orientation and the fact that it is not a constant thing. Where you find controversies arising over the teaching of evolution occur at intervals, uh, every six or seven or however many years in a given state or district. Uh, the science curriculum will be examined. And the next year, they'll look at the math curriculum. And the year after that, they'll look at the English language arts. I mean, but at regular five to seven years, generally, they'll take a look at the uh, science curriculum, and that's when uh, anti-evolutionism may appear. Right now, as we're talking, um, there's a problem in the state of Arizona over the adoption of state evolution standards where the um, Board of Education has, uh, has tinkered around with the coverage of climate change and, uh, and evolution in a way that is not good, and so citizens are pushing back against that. But you talked about anxieties. I think there are anxieties that people have, but they're... <laughs> Fascism functions much better with the more diffuse the anxieties are. If you are very precise about your anxieties, you can be disproved. So it's always better to have just sort of a general haze of anxiety out there, and you're going to be more successful in imposing your, uh, your uh, un uh, undemocratic uh, views. I, I don't think the creationism issue fits into that quite as well. 
It may be a secondary component if there is an upsurge of uh, more conservative forms of Christianity. But, you know, conservative Christianity is not monolithic, monolithic um, in terms of the kinds of political uh, views that, that you are talking about. Um, there are quite a few uh, green Christians, uh, environmentally oriented Christians, who really believe in stewardship theology, and it's their job to you know, reduce the amount of carbon. Climate change is a big problem. We have to do this, that, and the other. There are a lot of social justice Christians who are very concerned about things like immigration because we are our brother's keeper. They have biblical and theological reasons for uh, 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 re resisting some of the um, uh, anti-immigration uh, statutes and so forth that, that may be uh, on the way. So. You know, even if conservative religious views are uh, are um, uh, encouraged uh, by those who are uh, perhaps not reflecting what I would consider the best American values, uh, it doesn't mean that that is going to necessarily result in an increase in anti-evolutionism. So, Which so, a so, in a way, but in a way, you're suggesting that. It's not inevitable that there's a spillover from the evolution debate mm -hmm. to the climate change debate. In other words, there are different actors. Yeah. But the, the, the one variable here is inequality, economic inequality, and the funding mm -hmm. of opposition, for example, to climate change. Uh, is that something we need to worry about? Or is it really a strategy? What you need is a strategy of not lumping these things together. Uh, uh, if, if I, I think they're I think they're independent enough. There there's a small overlap, but it's it's focusing on that smallish overlap is probably not going to be the best use of resources. Even though climate change deniers are anti scientists or anti science in a way. I I don't think that they would consider themselves that. I, I, I don't see. I think that they uh, the people who, okay, they, they're not anti-science generically. They may be anti the research done in this field. And, uh, you know, I was, I've been talking to scientists on campus the last couple of days during my visit, which is always a yeah. very pleasant part of a visit like this. And I was talking to one uh, professor who was saying, well, you know, uh, the, the evolution issue is much more uh, straightforward than the climate change issue in that evolution has just been, been so... Um, uh, strongly established. Living things have common ancestors. That is the only explanation that explains biology as we know it today. And we know a lot about the mechanisms and genetics and so forth. With climate change, there are some things that we are absolutely positive about. There are core ideas of climate change as well. Yeah, CO2 and methane are warming gases. We know that. We know that they have increased uh, the inference is very clear that uh, the increase in warming gases has increased the temperature of the planet very rapidly over this short period of time. The modeling is something that is extraordinarily complicated and that scientists will disagree on. And, you know, scientific disagreement is the bread and butter of science. There's nothing wrong with that. And scientists will sometimes have exceedingly vigorous conversations and arguments about who's right. And eventually, a consensus is going to emerge. Um, but you know, when you're saying, you know, this model shows that in 15 years, the ocean is going to be uh, raised three feet, and somebody else says, OK, but your model is wrong in here, here, and here, and here. And my model shows that the uh, ocean will be up six feet. I mean, that is, could be, that, that is likely a legitimate scientific controversy. For we laymen, in terms of the climate change controversy, the important thing is, dang, the ocean's really going to be raising a lot. We got to do something about this. Splitting hairs over whether it's three feet or six feet may not be the big worry we should have. But people who are against the idea of anthropogenic uh, climate change are usually attacking that kind of thing rather than the basic uh, physics behind warming gases and their effect on the planet. Well, uh, Eugenie, I, I want to thank you very much for coming to Berkeley as the Hitchcock Lecture and taking time in that visit uh, to be on our program. And I would like to show your book again, Revolution uh, Versus uh, Creationism, and its uh, 
it's quite a good read for somebody wanting to be defined, uh, to, to learn more about that debate, which you've pay, played such an active part in. Uh, thank you very much for being here with us. Thank, thank you. you for inviting me. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history. <laughs>